that I used for a few months with their teaching learning center. And now I'm working as a postdoc at Subaru Telescope on this particular project, Project Panoptes. So now Panoptes is an acronym for Panoptic Astronomical Networked Observatories for a Public Transiting Exoplanets Survey. I know there's a lot of keywords in there, but don't worry about it right now. We'll get back to it later. This is just to let you know what Panoptis stands for. Now, in a very small nutshell, Project Panoptis can be defined as a citizen science project that aims to make it easy for anyone to build a low cost robotic telescope that can be used to detect transiting exoplanets. You saw the robot behind moving, the same one. But in order to learn what the project is about or how it works, it is important that we first understand the following two keywords in the definition of Project Panoptis, which is citizen science and exoplanets. Some of you might already be familiar with these terms, but since this also includes some general public, I thought it would be good to cover the base before talking about Panoptis itself. So let's start with citizen science. Now, when we speak of science, we have this tendency to immediately associate it with professional scientists. However, science as a field is not limited to or only practiced by the professionals with appropriate degrees. A lot of scientific research is also carried out by amateur scientists. I'm sure most of you by now have come across amateur astronomers or amateur astronomy groups in your city. If not, please look for an amateur astronomy group close to you. I guarantee you will have some amazing experiences with their astronomy activities. Coming back to citizen science. So citizen science is the practice of the public participating and collaborating in scientific research to increase scientific knowledge. Simply put, it is a collaboration between the people who are curious about a field and willing to take part and the scientists who are working on that field. Now, citizen science projects can vary widely with respect to the field. It also depends on the number of participants that are required for that particular project. The age group of the participants in the projects can vary a lot. Any prerequisite knowledge, so certain pro projects may require you to know about the project in advance. Some projects don't require you to know any information about that field in advance. The extent to which participants may be involved in the research itself. You might be in step one where you're collecting data. You might be in a project that involves you in step one and step two where you're collecting data and analyzing data and probably part of the publishing itself. So all this varies depending on the project. And it also depends on whether the participation is on site, where you're in person at a particular place to carry out the work or whether it's all done online. So to give a few examples, now one of the most well-known citizen science projects in India is Bird Count India and eBird. This is suitable for people who like to bird watch or do bird photography. Here, the interested participants create an online account and document their bird sightings with location, date, and time information. This is an on-site example of citizen science project where the participant also needs to be familiar with different species of birds in order to document the sightings correctly. This information is then used by scientists to study the bird population distribution, their area of spread, and understand their habitats. So two key things to take in this particular example is that this is an on-site project where you need to be at a certain location and then catalog that information. And you need to have some sort of prior information about birds and some knowledge about them so you're identifying them correctly. Here is another example. This is something that I took part in. This is called the humpback whale counting. And it happens in Hawaii every year when the humpback whales migrate close to the island. Now, this was also an on-site participation. I needed to be there at a certain location to take part in this project. But it did not require me to have any prior knowledge about marine biology or humpback whales. So the only thing I needed to know to take part in this citizen science project was to see the whales and count them. I just needed to know how to count numbers. That was my contribution. Now, one another citizen science project I volunteered a few years back was in archaeology. Here, the archaeologists needed help with putting together thousands of stone fragments 
to reconstruct a 1,200 year old Scottish monument. This was done completely online and I didn't need to have any knowledge of archeology span in order to do this. This was as good as just playing a jigsaw puzzle online. So kids could do this too. You didn't have to be on site and you didn't have to have any prior knowledge. This is just a game that I played where I would put the pieces together and click on save and the archeologists on the other side would try to fit those pieces and say yes or no, whether it worked or not. So citizen science projects are a plenty and it very often just comes down to picking the right one that works for you. Now in terms of your area of interest, it can be in terms of how much time you're ready to spend on it. If you prefer only online or on-site activities, your prior knowledge of the subject, et cetera. If there is a subject that you are interested in, just go online and search for citizen science along with the subject name, and you might be able to help the scientists in the subject. On that note, if you're interested in citizen science projects in astronomy, please do check out NASA's citizen science projects website. They fund several citizen science projects in several fields, not just astronomy. And uh, Project Panoptis is also in part funded by NASA. Let's move to the next topic, the next keyword, exoplanets. So starting with exoplanets. So let's start with the basic. What is an exoplanet? Now, exoplanets are just planets which are outside our solar system, which are not part of the eight planets that we know of, not orbiting our sun. Any planet which is outside of this system is referred to as an exoplanet, exo meaning outside, or it's also known as an extrasolar planet. Now, just like how the polar planets in our solar system are very different from one another, the exoplanets also differ greatly from one another. So they can be classified into different types based on parameters that I've listed here. That is the size of the planet or its radius, the mass of the planet. So like Jupiter is more massive than Earth, the orbit of the planet around its star, how far or close to the star the planet, planet is, so Saturn and Jupiter are farther away than Mercury and Venus. Whether the planet orbits a single star, like our planets orbit just the sun, or if they orbit a system of stars. So these are binary stars and you have a planet going around them. The composition of the planet itself, is it a rocky planet like Earth? Or is it a gas giant like Jupiter? Can it have carbon or water, etc.? So let's have a quick look at some of the types of exoplanets. So in the plot axis shown here, the vertical y-axis says planet radius Re. This refers to the size of the planet relative to our Earth's radius. So Re is radius of Earth. So one Re means same radius as Earth. Above this one Re line are the planets which will be bigger than Earth. And below this line are the planets that are smaller than Earth. So just make a note of where the one is on that axis. The horizontal y-axis is labeled as stellar flux Earth units. This refers to how much sunlight we receive on Earth, which is one stellar flux on this line. So Earth would fall in the, y, in the one on the vertical and the one on the horizontal in that region. To the left of this point of one on the x-axis, the value decreases and denotes exoplanets which are hotter than Earth. To the right of this point are cooler exoplanets. So we'll see the plot of the different types of exoplanets now. So one of the first things you might notice on this plot is that the exoplanets are also classified based on our own understanding of our own exosolar system planets. So exoplanets are called Earth-like or super-Earths or Jovians or cold Neptunes and so on. Jovians refers to giant planets like Jupiter's. So when we have this classification of exoplanets, very often it is in relative terms to what we know about our own solar system. Another thing you will notice on this plot are vertical lines between the planets. And these lines I have labels ZNS, which is zinc sulfide, H2O, which is water, CO2, which is carbon dioxide, and CH4, which is methane. These lines indicate the condensation lines where the labeled molecules will condense to form clouds in the planet atmosphere. 
this basically means that to the left of each of these lines, the temperature would be too high for those molecules to condense. So at that particular line, those molecules can start condensing because the temperature is right for that. So for example, let's take the cold Jovian that you see right on top, the big orange one to the right top corner. If you take the cold Jovian closer to its star, you are basically moving it to the left of this plot. And then it becomes a warm Jovian, which is capable of holding condensed water. Now coming to another part about exoplanets, the question of can we live on them? One of the biggest questions driving exoplanet studies is, is there life on other planets? Now, in the search for life, we look to see if an exoplanet falls in the habitable zone. The habitable zone, in the simplest sense, is the area around a star where it is not too hot and not too cold for liquid water to exist on the surface of the planet. So the habitable zone in this diagram is denoted in green. The red zone is where it is too hot for water to exist in liquid form, and blue zone is where it's too cold for and the water freezes. So the habitable zone is defined based on our current understanding of life of how life started and thrives on Earth. So this is what we think is the necessary criteria for life to exist based on what we have seen on Earth. Now, this is only the first step in finding the habitability of an exoplanet. It is then followed up with more detailed studies to look for chemical signatures of elements and compounds that can support the formation of life. So you might have recently heard a news claiming scientists found life on planet Venus. What scientists found was one of those chemicals in Venus's atmosphere called phosphine. Now, phosphine can be produced by different processes such as lightning, uh, meteor impacts, uh, volcanic activity, and by organic life forms. In the case of Venus, the amount of phosphine that was found could not be explained by any other process involving lightning or the meteor impact or the volcanic activity, leaving the only possible option as possibly organic life forms. However, it is important to note that life itself has not been detected on Venus. So finding the habitable zone is only the first criteria and then you have to look for multiple biosignatures of what can support life and create life on that planet. And then look for alternate possibilities of why those molecules might exist apart from life as well. Is life the only option for those particular molecules to exist? So how many exoplanets are there though? Now, as of today, there are 4,284 confirmed exoplanets. Now, these are planets that have been confirmed by more than one method. And you can see the breakup of the different types of uh, planets that have been found within these 4,284. So a lot of Neptune-like planets, a lot of gas giants, super Earths, a few terrestrial, and six of them unknown. There are 5,514 candidates, NASA candidates. These are likely planets, but they're yet to be confirmed by the multiple detection system. And there are also 3,197 planetary systems. These are the number of stars around which these 4,284 planets have been confirmed. And if you wish to see a catalog of all these confirmed exoplanets, you can check out the NASA's website. They have a complete catalog listed over there. So how do you find these exoplanets though? I mean, it took so long for us to find the planets within our own solar system, which were very far away, like Neptune. So how do you find these exoplanets, which exist in some other system very, very far away? So one of the first methods I'm going to talk about is called radial velocity and Doppler shift. You might have heard of Doppler shift before, likely in the context of sound waves, of uh, how the pitch of an ambulance's alarm changes as it approaches you and moves away. So something similar happens to light when a star moves towards us or farther away from us. When the star moves towards us, its wavelength shifts to a lower wavelength and it's called blue shifted. So the spectrum becomes slightly, slightly more bluish. And when the star moves away from us, its wavelength shifts to a higher wavelength and it's called said to be red shifted. Now, how does this help in finding an exoplanet though? Why would a star be moving around like that? 
So what happens is when you have a planet which is going around a star, the planet also exerts a little bit of gravitational pull on the star. This causes the star to slightly wobble. This wobble in turn causes the star to either slightly move towards us or away from us as the planet continues to orbit. And this causes a shift in the wavelength that can be measured. So we can find a little bit of the blue shift and a little bit of the red shift as and when the star slightly wobbles. So that is one way to detect that there is something around the star or close to the star, which is causing the star to wobble. So the second method that is used to find exoplanets is called the transit method. Now, uh, during a planet's orbit around the star, if and when the planet passes in front of the star, the star's light that's reaching us slightly reduces. This will depend on the size of the planet and the distance of the planet from the star, how much it reduces, how long it reduces, etc. This is known as a transit event. And the same as the transits of Mercury and Venus that you might have heard of in the last few years, which you see across the surface of the sun. This is the same as eclipses when the moon passes in front of the sun and blocks the sun. So on a much smaller scale though, where you have a planet which is very far away, blocking its star's light just a little bit. And by measuring this dip in the light, we can find out the properties of the exoplanet as well. We can find out how big it is or how far away it is from its star, etc. So this is another method that's used to detect exo uh, exoplanets. So method three is directly imaging an exoplanet. Now exoplanets are very far away and millions of times dimmer than the stars that they orbit. Taking a direct image of an exoplanet is very challenging. So one way is to block the light from the star. So the exoplanet can be seen without the star light saturating the camera. This is done by using a device called a coronagraph inside the telescope, which blocks only the light from the star before it reaches the telescope camera. This method is also used to study our sun's atmosphere without the sun saturating the image. So in, if you see in this image, that circle you see in the center, that is the coronagraph that is blocking the sun. So you can see the sun's layers and the atmospheres outside of it. So method four is called gravitational microlensing. So in gravitational microlensing, this happens when a star or a planet's gravity manages to focus a little bit of the light of a very distant star. So this is the same as any other micro lens, gravitational microlens you might have heard of where you can see a star through gravitational microlensing. So this causes the distant star to temporarily appear to be a tad bit brighter. So if the object which is causing this microlensing, in this image you see there is a star with a planet which is causing the microlensing. So if the object which is causing the microlensing is a star and a planet system, the distant star's light gets bent by both the star and the exoplanet. And this can be measured when you observe the light over time. So coming to method five, this is the last method. So we had already seen that a planet can cause its star to seemingly wobble a little because of the gravitation between them. Now this wobble can also be observed as a slight shift in the star's position in the night sky relative to its neighboring stars. So in the previous method, what we observed was the wavelength shift. Now we are seeing the actual star shifting slightly in position relative to all the neighboring stars. So this change in position of a star indicates that there is some other object near that star which is acting gravitationally on it. That is one way to find an exoplanet as well. So this plot shows you the methods which was used to discover the 4,284 confirmed exoplanets that we saw previously. So you can see that the most widely used method is the transit method, followed by the radial velocity, and then the microimaging and imaging is the least used method. So in the case of imaging, you need huge telescopes. So that was all the methods that are used to find exoplanets generally. Now we are talking about finding exoplanets from your backyard, right? 
So which one of these methods do you think is going to be useful for finding those exoplanets from your backyard of the five listed methods? So we'll move on to talking about project penalties to figure out the answer to that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Olivier Guyon. So I'm actually joining you uh, today, which for me in Hawaii is tonight, from the control room of the Subaru telescope. Um, so Subaru telescope is one of the largest telescopes in the world. Behind me, you can see the computer screens. The telescope is actually running because it's nighttime in Hawaii. Um, um, I'm in the control room in, in Hilo, which is uh, cl close to the coast, and uh, higher up at more than 4,000 meter uh, altitude, there is another control room where uh, my colleagues are actually running the telescope tonight. And tonight they're actually looking at exoplanets. Uh, they're looking at the spectroscopy of stars to detect exoplanets. Um, so uh, there is here a panoptest unit, a real panoptest unit, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But before I do that, um, let me show you a little bit what my, my day job is. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so my day job is, my, re my regular job is to uh, look for uh, exoplanets at the Subaru telescope. And uh, you can see a picture uh, of the Subaru telescope on the right. So it's a, it's a very large telescope, uh, more than eight meter uh, diameter. And on the left, uh, this is an image that uh, we took uh, of, a, of a system with four exoplanets. Um, so they are actually uh, four uh, planets circled by little uh, circle. And the, the interesting thing in that image is the star is gone because we've worked really hard to build a chronograph so the star is gone. So that's my regular job. And it's actually very difficult. Uh, you need a very large telescope to do that. Uh, so here is a picture of the Subaru telescope. Uh, in the bottom, you can see of that picture, you can see the mirror, which is more than eight meter uh, diameter. Um, so you may think, oh, to look for exoplanets, you need um, a, a, a very large telescope, but that's not true, actually. Uh, we're going to talk about Project Panoptes, which is using very small telescope. And so uh, it's a citizen science project, as Preeti uh, described. Uh, here is a picture of one of our Panoptes units. Uh, so you can see it's actually very small, and you can see it here behind me. Um, so as Preeti mentioned, uh, the most productive way to find exoplanet is the exoplanet transit technique. Uh, essentially, you just have to wait uh, for a planet to pass in front of a star. The star will get a little bit dimmer, and if you can stare at enough stars for enough time, uh, you will eventually pick up those events. Uh, so uh, exoplanet transit, it seems easy because uh, you're just measuring the brightness of the star, which is not that difficult. But it's actually very difficult because uh, you don't know, if you're looking for a new planet, you don't know which star to look at, and you don't know when the transit will happen. So you have to look at lots of stars for a very long time. Um, and that's actually a very interesting project for citizen science because um, professional uh, uh, te um, telescopes like the one, like the Subaru telescope, they're very big, but they have a very small field of view. They can only look at a very tiny patch of the sky, usually one or a few stars at a time. Uh, so what you need is quite different. You need a, a, a wide field telescope, something that can look at a large number of stars at the same time. And ideally, you need many of them all over the world so you can follow most of the sky most of the time. And this is why Project Panoptes is such a great project for citizen science, because uh, it actually makes a lot of sense uh, as, as a, a very serious exoplanet uh, survey by itself. So when we started this project, there were, there were really three challenges, three questions that uh, we needed to answer. Uh, is it possible uh, for citizen scientists to build a small robotic telescope that can scan the sky every clear night? Because we need that to follow as many stars as possible for as long as possible. Uh, can this be done in a simple way that's affordable, that's not too expensive? Can we use regular cameras? Can we use a simple telescope design not using a large dome around it? 
Um, and finally, can these telescopes, once they're built, work together as part of a global network, uh, sharing and combining images so that we can follow uh, a large number of stars? So specifically, uh, if a tele one of the telescope looks at uh, a, a field with, with stars, the daytime uh, arrives in the morning, can another one somewhere else take over that same field? Uh, so those are the challenges that we have been working on for several years now. Um, so we started with uh, uh, prototype designs to see if we could build something that's, um, that's uh, not very expensive and, 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 and simple enough uh, to assemble. So here are some of our early prototypes. Uh, you can see that they look different from each other because as we uh, started, we basically made mistakes and then we optimized and, and improved. And this is what we uh, settled upon. Uh, this is what a panoptest unit looks like. So there's one behind me, um, but here's a, a little more detail. Um, the main thing here, the main two things you notice is that uh, we use regular digital cameras, not expensive professional cameras, regular uh, digital cameras. Um, and we also have something that does not have a dome. Uh, if you look at uh, most telescopes, you expect to see a dome. Uh, we decided to keep it simple and not to have a dome. Uh, just uh, basically having the cameras in a, in a box uh, that's uh, weatherproof. So if it rains or if it's daytime, uh, they're protected. They just look down. Uh, and we did a little bit of uh, uh, weatherproofing so that if it rains, the, all of the electronics is okay. So uh, this is uh, uh, our first unit being installed uh, in Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. So you can see uh, myself and uh, two, two of my colleagues assembling uh, the unit, and you can see it's two eyes here. It's also sort of two lenses with the two cameras. Uh, the, and, and the mount is, is a mount that will basically uh, track the stars at night. So uh, here's an example of an image that, uh, that uh, th this takes. Uh, so it's a very uh, nice image. We actually were uh, fortunate. We were looking at, uh, at a comet, Comet Lovejoy, and a meteorite passed in the field. Uh, but the, one, the thing that's most important when looking for planets, for exoplanets, is not so much the comet and the meteorite. It's all the stars you can see in this image. There are uh, more than 10,000 stars in this image. Uh, so every image that the camera takes has a very large number of stars that we can follow. Here is another image. Uh, so this is a, a, a full field image. Uh, this is a, a constellation of Scorpius, which is very interesting because it's got lots of stars, but it also has dust and and clusters. Uh, and, and so you can see um, the full image here is about 10 by 15 degrees. That's the size of a small constellation in the sky. And if we zoom in, you can see even more details, even more stars. So it seems surprising, but uh, a regular camera can actually take these uh, nice uh, high quality images. And to do that, uh, it only needs two things. One thing, we need to be able to take a long exposure. So this is an exposure which is Typically, we, 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 we leave each exposure is a few minutes, and we need to track the sky so that those exposures are sharp. And that's what we've done here. Uh, but that's only uh, the beginning of the story. Now, the next thing we need, need to do is, is measure the brightness of stars very accurately with these images. And so that's something we've put quite a bit of work into. Um, I won't have time to go over the detail, but one of the challenges was that the stars are falling on pixels of different colors. The stars have their own colors. Uh, so we've actually worked for several years to, um, uh, to figure out how to do that. And, and, and we've demonstrated now that, that we can do that. Uh, and probably the best example is, uh, is, is, is this. So we had a, a, a group of students in California build a, a one of the Panoptes units. And from the roof of their university building, uh, they deployed it and they looked at a star, which we knew had an exoplanet, and they were able to measure, uh, to detect the exoplanet. You can see the, the measurement of the brightness on the right. So this, this basically tests that everything's working and that uh, the system, although quite simple and, and not very expensive, can detect exoplanets. And then after this success, that uh, small uh, telescope was actually installed on Mount Wilson uh, in, uh, in an observatory that's uh, not very far from where they build it. So you can see the, the team installing uh, their unit uh, on, on a tall pier because they were next to a, to, to building. So what's next? 
Well, now that we've actually completed the design, that we know it works, that we know it can detect exoplanets, um, we are turning this into a citizen science project where multiple groups, schools, citizen scientists can build their own. And what we're doing, Preeti, myself, and the rest of the team, is we are helping uh, various groups uh, build this, uh, this unit. So here is a, a map of the world uh, with some of the units uh, highlighted. The green ones are the ones that are running. Um, you can see actually there is one next to India in, uh, in Bhutan, uh, which one was one of our uh, recent uh, deployment. Um, so what it looks like for a team is basically they start in the lab, uh, they will assemble the unit, uh, so you can see a unit on the left in the final stages of, uh, of, of building. And once it's done, they, uh, they test it at night, uh, as shown on the right here. This is a unit in Arizona, in the US. Um, and then uh, ideally, they can put it in a place where the sky is good uh, and it will robotically run night after night. Every time, basically, the, uh, night, the sky is clear, the unit will start taking pictures. And what we're really doing is a whole process of training students uh, who become builders. Uh, and they, then once uh, uh, students have, or citizen scientists have completed a build, they also, they train the next generation of builders. So here are some examples of, of teams we've worked with. Uh, some of the uh, highlighted teams here uh, in Italy, in the middle and at the top right. Uh, uh, two of our members, uh, team members, uh, 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 training students in Bhutan in the lower right. Uh, and uh, in the lower left, you can see uh, one of the, uh, the youngest teams, uh, uh, middle school, uh, building a unit. So we are, uh, we are helping uh, citizen scientists and, uh, and students build units. So um, I'll, I'll finish by uh, actually showing you a little uh, demo of how the unit works. This was prepared by one of our students, so I will change my screen. So uh, before I do that, here is um, uh, one of our units. Uh, this is a demo unit, so it doesn't have all the weatherproofing, but you can see it has a mount and it has two cameras and it moves. So uh, I'm moving it, I'm using the, the hand paddle, but the real unit, when it's deployed, there's a small computer that will basically uh, run it and it will, uh, it will do this completely automatically. So now I'm gonna share another screen. Um, so this is actually a, a 3D visualization that was prepared by one of our students, um, which shows a, 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 a 3D rendering of the unit. And so this is what the unit does in the daytime, it's pointing down. So the mount is actually looking uh, down. You can see the lenses are pointing down. And this is what we need to do so that the sunlight doesn't get into the lenses. And this is also what the unit will automatically do if it's raining. Now let's actually make it uh, look at the sky at night. So here I actually turn, uh, I made the sun go down. Now we have a starry sky. Uh, some of you may actually recognize some constellations. Here is uh, the, 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 big, uh, the Big Dipper behind. Um, and uh, what happens then at night is the unit will uh, start observing. So the mount will rotate and the unit will track the sky. Um, and that's how those, those images are taken. So I'll go back to uh, my last slide. So uh, here is our contact information if you want to, uh, to learn more. Um, there is a, we have a webpage, projectpanoptest.org. And if you want to uh, learn more about the project, uh, you can email us at info at projectpanoptest.org. Um, we actually uh, hold a public meeting every month. Uh, and our next meeting will be uh, October 1st at unfortunately a time which is not ideal for uh, those of you living in India. 3:30 uh, a.m. Uh, IST, uh, but please drop us an email if you want to um, to join this meeting and learn more about the project. So I think we probably have time for uh, some questions now. I will we'll stop sharing my screen. And uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. And I think we have time for some questions. Okay, so we have queries. I'm also handling the live <laughs> event on YouTube, so 
I uh, hope you understand. So uh, we, we have some uh, young students asking questions about uh, a question. I think this one is to Preeti for her uh, talk on exoplanets. So, uh, you know, this is not directly related to a Panoptus, but uh, I'm sure uh, uh, people want to know that uh, more about the Goldilocks zone because, you know, it's uh, alien life and can, can life exist there. Also, they would like to know if, uh, you know why uh, only this kind of Goldilocks zone is considered if uh, there might be other kinds of life which can live in other kinds of conditions also. So why are we just looking for that particular zone? Preeti? I think Olivia you might be more suited to answer this. Or, yes, sure. <laughs> yeah, um, that, so that's a great question because that's really what excites us most, looking for life. Um, the, there is a general understanding that if a planet is too close to the star, it will be too hot and not suitable for life. We can look at uh, our own solar system. Mercury is quite close to our sun, and uh, it, is, it is very hot, so hot that the atmosphere has escaped. It, it can't really sustain uh, an atmosphere. It's not massive enough also. And if we go too far, uh, everything becomes very cold. Um, life on a planet, well, on a, on a body like Pluto would not be very easy to sustain, at least not in the same way that it is on Earth. That's why the best place to look for life is uh, uh, in, in what Pretty explained uh, being the habitable zone. That's where the temperature is, is right so that you can have liquid water on the surface of the planet. However, as the question points out, there may be other forms of life. In our solar system, for example, uh, there may be life in under uh, the uh, oceans that uh, are uh, below the surface of the moons of, of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn. Um, there may be life uh, in atmosphere of Venus. Uh, so I think it's a very interesting and complex question. The thing that we tend to be doing is looking for life where it's easiest uh, and where it would be the easiest to detect life like uh, on Earth has completely changed the way Earth looks like, even if we look at it from far away. And that's the first thing we want to do, is look for the life, life that's easy to detect. Great. So uh, we have some uh, questions about the system itself. So I think uh, this is, uh, uh, if it is on, we can ask that. So uh, uh, one question is, why do we need two cameras for the system? And, uh, you know, what is the yeah, technical reason or if there's any reason in simpler words, you could also answer so that. So that's, that's a great question because there are two answers to that question. Maybe I can give the first answer and Priti can give the second sure. answer. Uh, the first answer is- Can I get the, the nice detail. one? <laughs> you get the nice one. I'll give, okay. the, I'll give the technical one. Uh, okay. We did a study, we did a, you know, we want the system to be cheap, not very expensive, but also to be quite powerful. And so there's a trade-off. You know, you could put one lens, uh, and it's a little bit cheaper. But if you put two lens, it's 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 a little more expensive, but it's twice as powerful. And then you can put four lenses. We actually tried that in one of the prototypes. It gets even more powerful, but even more expensive. And so there's a trade-off between cost and and how powerful the system is. And we decided to go with two lenses because that was sort of a good trade-off. And um, I'll, I'll let Priti give the, uh, the other uh, answer, which may actually be even more important. Yeah, so the answer I'm gonna give, I believe was the more important reason for why we have two lenses or two cameras instead of any other number. It just simply comes down to, it looks cute. <laughs> Honestly, it looks like Wally. And it's not the same with four cameras on a single camera. So that was one of the main reasons. Yes, that's definitely <laughs> something we think of when we look at it. Yes, Wally is what comes to mind, the cute little apparatus. Anyway, so I'm sure uh, it's it's not just that, and Olivia has given us uh, another technical reason for that. Uh, well, we have, have people asking about, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, sorry, what is the SNR value for uh, detecting these exoplanets? Maybe you showed some uh, values earlier. 
Well, that's a very uh, technical question, so I'll try to Does answer it in a way that everyone can understand. Uh, SNR uh, stands for signal to noise ratio, and that is the way that uh, scientists measure uh, how good something is detected, how well it's detected. Uh, so it's a ratio between the signal, which is what you're trying to see, and the noise, which is everything else that's left uh, in your measurement. Uh, the noise is what you don't want, the signal is what you want. Uh, a signal-to-noise ratio is a way to quantify how good a detection is. In general, uh, we, uh, we, we consider that if the signal is about five to seven times stronger than the noise, you have a good detection, and anything below is questionable. Uh, for Panoptes, if we look at a Jupiter-type planet, uh, we reach, with, with a few units, we reach that solid detection level uh, basically for a Jupiter-sized planet around the Sun-like star. So that gives you sort of a, of, a, of a baseline. Anything that's smaller than a Jupiter-sized planet uh, with, uh, with, with a single point of test unit, the, the detection is not robust enough. With the, the, the SNR is too low. However, uh, if you combine lots of units uh, from all over the world looking at the same uh, star, you can actually build up your detection. You can, you can get to higher SNR, but more solid detection. And so the strength of the Panoptes network as a citizen science project is the more units people build, the more... I think there's some connection problem. Maybe Preeti, could you... Uh take over the answer. Oh, sorry, I missed that particular question. I was responding to questions in chat. No, I understand, yeah. So I think uh, we'll still request everybody not to send private chats to the speakers directly. Uh, send them to me. We are uh, going through them and uh, we'll make them available to the speakers. Uh, Olivia, your uh, feed has somehow got stuck, but I think we'll just carry on with some uh, some important questions which uh, Preeti could uh, take. So. Uh, I think uh, so. Some people are asking about uh, the necessity of clear skies here, and uh, so what kind of skies do you need? Somebody uh, staying in a light polluted sky with, let's say, bottle class eight, uh, it's a uh, not a very commonly known thing, but uh, you know, a very really highly uh, light polluted sky. How can they contribute? And so, what do you expect the apparatus uh, limit of uh, sky management to be? Uh, so as of now, we we do not discourage anyone from installing a unit depending on your sky quality, because uh, what happens is like Olivia pointed out that at the end of the day we are combining data from multiple units. So if you have a unit which is not in very great sky conditions, you will still be able to observe some of the very bright stars. So right now we have a limit of like um, I think we can go up to the twelfth magnitude. So if you're in a place where it's typically a little light polluted, then maybe that magnitude will reduce a little, but the unit will still be capable of observing a lot of the bright stars, which is still useful information. And the information becomes useful because we're going to combine it with so many units which are observing the same fields. And it's also useful because we are going to look at this particular information over a certain time. So we're looking for a variation in time. So this unit will be able to contribute towards the bright stars. So it's not that if you have a bad sky, you don't install it. It will just be useful in a different manner compared to something that's in a dark sky. Sure, that's uh, that's good. So uh, there's some people also asking about uh, what kind of costs are involved in this, and uh, do they need any need any specialized uh, software for this? Okay, so uh, the cost to build a unit is of the order of uh, five thousand US dollars. And uh, we are right now working on a unit which, uh, where we have changed some of the parts, we have updated the cameras, and that might bring down the cost by another $400 to $500 maybe. So I would anyway look at an average cost of $4,500 to $5,000 US dollars. And uh, for those of you who are already in the astronomy over here, you know how much mounts cost. So we use an equatorial mount, so that is one of the bulk part of the cost, and the DSLR cameras. So there might be little places where you can spend a little lesser, depending on how you design it. But this would be the average 
So what what does that um, mean in Indian rupees? <laughs> Just for I think that's like three and a half lakhs. Okay. Of that order. Okay. But then it could be done, I suppose, in uh, in collaboration. So if there's a group yes. uh, which has uh, yes. cameras already and they have some. Yeah. Video. So it can either be done as part of an amateur astronomy group, or the other option is, let's say, if you have a university that's ready to pay for a project. Okay. So this can be taken up as a project by multiple students in a group, have it installed for the university. Okay. And students who come in later can also take part in it. So every year as the students change, they can all take new observations, have new data to analyze. So this can be a continued effort for the university itself, for okay. the college. That's, that's great. And uh, is there any special for uh, thing you require, like uh, any software which you guys provide to, uh, so this. there is a software which has been developed for the project itself and every aspect of this project is open source. Okay. So it means you can take whatever information you want and use it how you want. So how much you want to be tied to the project is up to you. So for example, if you want to build a unit, but you don't want to necessarily look at exoplanets, you want to look at something that's beautiful happening in the sky, that's up to you. So you as the builder get complete control over how it's used. And starting from the build, the installation, everything is open source. So even if you are not immediately interested in going for a build, but you're interested in looking at the data, the data is open source as well. So you can either use the data in its raw format from where by going to the website, or you can look at it in the final form, which is in the light curves, take the raw, make your own light curves anyway. So all the information is available to the public. Everything is open source, and it's open to everyone. I think uh, Olivia is back. <laughs> Sorry for the tech problem here. Uh, Preeti has just answered about the cost and the uh, software, which is useful. Uh, but also, I mean, if in particular, is there a, what kind of support is provided by the Panoptis team uh, for anybody willing to put this, uh, put a station up at their place? Olivia, could you uh, say something about that? Thank you for unmuting me. Yes, um, the, uh, the the that's actually where most of our technical work is is it has been in the recent couple of years. Is is all of the software infrastructure uh, to support the network to basically make sure that the data that uh, uh, that is taken can be combined together. Um, and so there's a lot of work that has done in the support both to make sure that the Panoptest unit can act as a fully autonomous robot, um, but also uh, to uh, combine the data together uh, and help uh, those uh, who uh, work with us to build the unit to actually uh, install the software uh, and also have full control of, of, of their unit if they want to do something else with it, like take a, a nice image of a galaxy or a nebula. Lovely. So uh, I think uh, most of the people here, uh, the serious ones, they would like to know if uh, they can form their form this form a team and have this uh, basically. Uh, so I think the answer is yes, and uh, we are. Uh, we've also been told about the kind of the cost and the other infrastructure uh, associated. Uh, you can have a look at the uh, project website and also get in touch. I suppose uh, with uh, uh, both of our uh, experts here. At some uh, point of time, you can uh, find out more details from them and the support will be given by them. So just to add to yes, those who are seriously looking to be involved in some way, I would again remind and encourage them to join our public meeting, which is happening on the, this would be 30th over here. And I think this would be first early morning, 3.30 a.m. Unfortunately, it's a bad time, but for those in amateur astronomy, that's very usual time. So. So I would encourage you all to join for that meeting if you're interested in being a part of it and look for our email ID. I put it in the chat as well or you can go to our website and drop us a mail saying that you're interested and we'll send you this video. Sure. So there's one question which uh, some students are asking that uh, what kind of uh, detection have been made uh, or probable detections have been made by Panoptus yet and uh, could school students or anyone else 
just simply uh, participate in the uh, data processing, just the data processing. Yeah, that's another great question because that's exactly what we want Fun of Test to be. Uh, it, it's really about uh, students and citizen scientists interacting with the data, uh, doing interesting things with it, and, and discovering their own exoplanet. So what we've done so far uh, is we have uh, we have had uh, we've confirmed that a single Fun of Test unit can detect. Uh, planets. So we've pointed the, the planet test units at, at planets where at stars where we know we expect the transit to happen. And uh, as I showed, we can actually see the transit. The next phase of the project is really to go from there to a whole survey where we can combine data from multiple units. And um, that's where we've been putting a lot of the work, especially in the software in the, in the res recent uh, couple of years. In addition to that, uh, we're also, as, as Preeti mentioned, all the data is public. So we've started building an interactive uh, website where uh, anyone can go and download data. Uh, and together with that, we're starting to build up examples of data processing projects. Um, so again, if you're interested in that, in just the data processing, uh, contact us, send, send us an email at info at and we can, uh, we can go to the next step and show you how to do that. Um, um, but that's something that we're actually building up quite rapidly. Lovely. So uh, I can see that most of the questions are being answered in, a, in some way or the other by uh, your replies till now. And uh, many other questions are there, but they are about uh, uh, <laughs> they're about the exoplanets themselves. And uh, since uh, you are all experts in that too, maybe we can take. Uh, uh, one or two. I think there's there are and there are some many uh, technical questions as well. Okay, so uh, we can. So we collecting the questions here. So so some person is asking uh, why uh, why are space telescopes needed and if we can do this from the Earth. With Panoptis. Uh, another very good question. Space telescopes are, um, are are very challenging to build and very expensive compared to ground to telescopes on the ground. So astronomers use telescopes uh, in space to basically do things they cannot do with telescopes on the ground. Um, and and for exoplanets, especially for exoplanet imaging. Uh, the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, is actually quite annoying um, because some of the light is blocked by the atmosphere, especially if we look in the infrared, in the thermal light of the planets, uh, but also the light is banned by the atmosphere. So there is a lot of activity uh, to design future space telescopes um, that will be very powerful uh, for imaging of exoplanets. Um, the other uh, thing that uh, has been done very successfully in space is exoplanet transit at the extreme precision. Uh, so you may have heard about a, a mission, a NASA mission called Kepler. Uh, it was launched with a single telescope to have the precision to uh, see Earth-like planets around sun-like stars using the transit technique. Um, it's interesting that Panoptes is uh, following a very different strategy, which is not to have a single telescope, but to have a lot of telescopes so we can combine the data. Uh, so we're building precision in a, in a different way. But in general, space telescopes uh, are what is uh, needed uh, when, uh, when you basically need to do things that are uh, so precise uh, that you can't do them on the ground. Okay, and the uh, general question is, uh, why, why is the discovery of exoplanets important? Uh, and what are what what do you uh, what excites you about the future of this project? Well, I think that um, the, the the main answer to that question is really the search for life in the universe. Are we alone? Um, did life uh, happen uh, essentially by chance on Earth? Uh, and only on Earth, or is it uh, happening many places in the universe? And so the best places to look for life um, is, is essentially uh, 
planets, exoplanets. Uh, you know, we, we're looking for life uh, on the surface of other planets orbiting other stars. So I think that's the most interesting uh, answer to that question is, is really looking, are we alone, looking for life elsewhere? Sure, that's definitely something which drives us. And uh, I think that's the most popular question being asked is about uh, life on other planets, etc. And uh, how we can reach them, uh, how we can, <laughs> when will we reach them, what is the technology needed, etc. I think that those things are, uh, I mean, they, they, they can uh, take up another lecture in itself on uh, exo life, <laughs> as we might call it. So uh, uh, just... Uh, uh, just to summarize this uh, discussion and the meeting, uh, it was to present to you this uh, amazing project, very low scale but useful and important project called Panoptis. Uh, it is possible for uh, small groups to actually uh, do this themselves at uh, their place. If uh, you can collect together you know, a team and uh, make this, maybe in a college, a school, uh, amateur group, anybody can take this up. And uh, the, the team and the project are actually looking for partners across the world so that there can be more data and uh, the transits, as they are called, uh, they could be followed over time. The, time, the light curves could be made uh, more accurate. So uh, there is a possibility potential for people to join this. Uh, the, Preeti has pointed out what kind of sky conditions are needed as well. So yes, uh, it is possible for uh, you know relatively dark sky people to also contribute this. So uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, you stay in touch with us. Uh, we'll work with the Panoptus team and at Ayuka also uh, we'll uh, work with you if you're interested in doing such, such things. We will of course uh, come back to you with more lectures on many other projects which, which, where also you can uh, you know, put in your efforts as an amateur astronomer, as somebody who can devote time to the observation of the sky other than their day jobs or uh, day school or day college, <laughs> whatever your profession may be. So uh, please uh, stay with us uh, in this series, stay connected to us and uh, hope that you will basically keep looking at uh, our website, our uh, social media, our YouTube channel for more such events which will come in the future. Do subscribe to our YouTube. If, for those who are watching on YouTube, we will send out notifications once in a while. Uh, the uh, Panoptics team, thank you very much, Olivia, thank you very much, Preeti, and all the team which is working in the background, we are very thankful that uh, you could connect with us. And uh, a lot of preparation has gone into this meeting, and uh, a lot of effort will go into the follow-up. So we are very happy that you could all join this meeting here. Uh, last word about the M Visa program, which we have also announced uh, in our poster. So. Uh, at Ayuka, for the during the last decade, we've had uh, several instances of, of uh, program which ran, ran for a few months at Ayuka itself with uh, some amateur astronomers who were very serious about observations, joining us and actually getting instructions from uh, Ayuka astronomers into how to use simple equipment to do uh, various uh, serious kind of observations. So of course, as uh, we keep saying, joking that, okay, fine, after uh, we have seen uh, the rings of Saturn and <laughs> moons of Jupiter, what do we do with our telescope, right? So you can see that, uh, I mean, something like Panoptis uh, could be done with your DSLR camera. There might be other projects where you could use your six inch telescope and a camera or a you know, simple photometer that you could make yourself to uh, collect light curves and submit it for some science. So we will continue uh, that kind of activity online uh, this um, year and we expect that uh, soon we will be uh, having other projects joining us and after that uh, we announce the MVSA test so we usually of course we have to uh, you know uh, see the seriousness level of the people to be getting involved and uh, the selected participants will get a chance to interact with Ayuka faculty and other uh, important astronomers across India who would be ready to do this kind of a pro uh, professional amateur interaction, which is short called pro am interaction, and I think it will be useful to all the uh, people who are really willing to contribute to uh, astronomy and uh, exoplanets. As you can see, such an important and exciting field, which has even fetched a Nobel Prize uh, last year. Uh, can uh, the search can be done now from your backyard? 
And I'm sure uh, you could also easily uh, look for uh, comets or uh, you know other transit phenomena with your small telescopes. Just the, probably the a small poke or, or a organized effort is needed. And we are happy to uh, coordinate that under the MVSA program. So we'll be uh, getting back to you. Uh, we have all your email IDs. So thanks for taking that trouble to register. And if you had to click one or twice, once or twice here and there, I think it was worth the effort. effort. So we have uh, come to the end of this uh, session. It was a uh, good session uh, with two talks and uh, a lot of questions answered. As I said, uh, if there are any uh, remaining questions, we'll attempt to answer them uh, later. So Professor Rai Choudhury is here. Would you like to say a few uh, no, words? I, 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 <laughs> I'm very happy that it was a fantastic beginning and, and a wonderful talk. Thanks very much, Olivier, and thanks, thanks, Riti, for, for taking all the questions. It's a very, very exciting project. Thanks, Amit, for organizing. My pleasure. So we'll uh, stay in touch. Much. And uh, thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Preeti. Any, any last words to, uh, before we end the meeting? Let's go find planets. Yes. Yes. <laughs> From your backyard. <laughs> Lovely. I think one of the great things that you did was to show the different aspects of citizen science that, that people can engage in. And I think there are so many ways, even if one doesn't want to go out and get a telescope, there's so many other things that you can do. That's great. Lovely. So uh, do join us. Uh, join back. Uh, we'll be announcing the meeting, uh, next meeting or next talk. Uh, and we expect it to be within the, I mean, in a, in a fortnight or so. So we'll see you again. Uh, online at the same meeting zone on Zoom next time. Thank you again, Preeti. Thank you, Olivia. And thank you all. Thanks to the whole audience for being so patient and <laughs> doing this in our organized way very much. Uh, we appreciate that. Thank you and have a good day. Hi, all good? Yes. We recording soft but we'll be the